for a couple of weeks. It is good to be back. You look good. You look awesome. Uh, we, uh, Jenny and I uh, were in Ireland actually for the last, well, for 10 days we were in Ireland and then uh, we took, uh, we were on a kind of a ministry trip where there was three churches in Ireland uh, that we were uh, serving, loving, helping to encourage and strengthen. And, and as you know, part of our uh, mission as a church or one of our pursuits as a church is what we call describe as neighborhoods to nations. And, and we want to be those who are not just here gathering. We want to reach out to people locally. We want to serve missions. Uh, around the world, the kingdom of God being established around the world. But we also, when we believe one of the key ways that happens is through strengthening, encouraging, and building up local churches. And, and, uh, and so that's what we got the opportunity to do. I feel like the Lord uh, is connecting our church to some dis- specific nations around the world. Cambodia would be one of those. And we took a trip there earlier this year with the team. Uh, and I think Ireland is another one of those nations that it just seems like the Lord is connecting us. And uh, I have a few show and tell pictures I can show you. Uh, we, uh, Jenny and I got to minister uh, and be with three churches. Uh, the Hills Church, which is up in Derry or London Derry. Uh, how many of you know the song Sunday Bloody Sunday, you too? I, say, I just said that in church. Some of you know, it's okay. You can admit, they're the world's best rock band. Come on, it's you too. But anyway, uh, they wrote a song about that city because there's some atrocities and, and terrorism that's taken place. In fact, it's shocking to know that in certain sections of that city, and it's not that big of a city, there's about 100,000 people or so in that city, um, you don't call the police, you call your local paramilitaries. They take care of things for you. You know what I'm saying? Like that still happens in 2023 in Ireland. And so, uh, so we got to minister uh, and be with a team there, great church. We got to be in Belfast with a small church that's just started in March called Abbey Life Church, and they are doing phenomenal. And then we drove down to the south. I drove a right-hand drive car in a left-hand drive country and didn't crash it. I was awesome. It was awesome. First time ever. My wife said, you did really good. I was like, yeah, come on. Uh, um, but uh, we went to Limerick, uh, which is uh, down in the southwest corner of Ireland. And uh, there's a church there. Now, you have to understand, and I'm going to give you some statistics. The Rugby World Cup is happening right now. Some of you don't even know that. I can't believe it. I mean, it's the world's greatest sport. I know football has started here, you know, but football's a girl's game, honestly. (laughs) Rugby's where it's at. I know I just offended some people this morning. I'm so sorry. But the Rugby World Cup is on, and Ireland is the number one team in the world. We're hopefully going to win this thing, okay? I was going to wear my Irish rugby jersey this morning, but my wife wouldn't let me. You guys would have been okay with that, though, right? 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 Thank you. Uh, I'll wear it sometime in the future. But uh, actually, if they win the World Cup, that's when I'll wear it. That's when I'm going to wear it. Yeah, that's when I'm going to do it. Anyway, uh, 2% of the population of Ireland right now are in France watching the Rugby World Cup. Let that sink in for a minute, okay? That's how popular the sport is. 2% of the population of Ireland is in France watching the Rugby World Cup right now. 1% goes to church. 1% is saved in Ireland. And, uh, and the Lord is just doing some amazing things. And, uh, and uh, so there's a church that we were with in Limerick that is a church of about 600 people. Now, a church of a 600 people in Ireland is like a church of 10,000 people here. You gotta understand, like there's not like a million churches in Limerick. And uh, this church has 48 nations represented and just amazing what the Lord is doing. And I think the Lord is connecting us and uh, maybe we'll take a team there in the future. How many want to go? Um, it's, no, it's not. It's a missions trip. It's not a tourism. You gotta understand that, okay? We're gonna work. <laughs> you know, we're gonna serve. But anyway, thank you for going, letting us go and uh, just amazing and, uh, and it was just a great time. We also uh, got the opportunity. My daughter then flew over and uh, she's now attending the University of Edinburgh doing her master's there and so we got to help her uh, kind of get settled and get a bank account set up and all that kind of stuff and so uh, really fun to be there. So we are starting a new series uh, today. We're gonna take three weeks and I, I felt like as we were heading into the fall, I felt like the Lord was just kind of stirring something in my heart that really is a, a felt need in our culture. And, uh, and it's something that is, a, 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 I actually, the Surgeon General would say, it's actually reached, excuse me, an epidemic level. And, and I think that the Bible and the church has the answer to a major problem that our culture is facing. And, uh, and, and really, it's centered around this idea of loneliness and isolation and friendship. And so we're going to do a little three-week series on friendology. Now, how many of you like to have friends? Okay, so that's like not very many. So the rest of you don't want to have friends? 
okay, I obviously, we're talking about the right thing this morning, you know? Uh, But friendship makes life better. In fact, meaningful friendship, you and I were actually designed for meaningful friendship, meaning that when we don't experience that kind of friendship, we feel like there's something missing in our lives. Now, the statistics, the scientists, the sociologists, they're all t- saying the same thing, that we're, we're actually wired for friendship, and when you have healthy friendships, you have a healthier life. You have more balance. In fact, they they say that the benefits of friendship are emotional and mental and psychological and even physical. Mayo Clinic did a study on the health, the physical health of people related to friendship. And those who had healthy friendships had healthier lives. They were healthier people, physically healthier people. And so we recognize that that there's, there's something inbuilt in each one of us that we desire, at least some of you in the room, desire friendships right? That we're actually wired for friendships. And what I've noticed over the last number of months, maybe even number of years, is that I've been having a growing number of conversations with just people inside our church, outside of our church, people here locally, people kind of around the nation and around the world. And there's like this ongoing conversation around friendships and relationships and and the sense of, man, wanting to have meaningful connections with other people. My kids... Uh, You know, my 24-year-old, he now lives in L.A., and he moved there three months ago. And so one of our conversations has been, man, he found a place to live, and he's uh, got a great job. But the conversation, almost on a weekly basis now, is around friendships. How do I make great friendships? How do I keep meaningful friendships in my life? My daughter just moved to Edinburgh, and similar conversation. Even though 35,000 people also moved to Edinburgh to go to school there, Right? She's having a conversation with me and her mom about, man, making friendships. How do I make friendships? In fact, while we were in Edinburgh getting her settled, we were having this conversation about friendships and building relationships and all of this, and she was reminding us of a conversation or a friendship that she developed when she was in second grade. And uh, she'd been uh, second grade uh, hanging out, um, you know, and she kind of made a connection with this person and, and this other girl and in second grade, and, and uh, they seemed to kind of hit it off a little bit on the playground or whatever. And so they actually happened to be in the bathroom, and they were in separate stalls, and they got into a conversation in separate stalls. And Sophie says, hey, do you want to be my friend? In the bathroom. <laughs> and the other girl said, yeah, I want to be your friends. And a, a, a beautiful friendship started in a bathroom. <laughs> now, some of you are wondering, what's the point of the message? The point of the message is go to the bathroom. That's where you make. No, that's not the point of the message. But don't you wish making friends, keeping friends, having a healthy relationship was as easy today as an adult as it was when you were in second grade? And I want to talk about it because we are facing an epidemic of isolation, loneliness, a lack of meaningful relationships in our culture. And I happen to believe that the Bible and the church and our relationship with who God is and how God has wired us actually is the solution to the problem that our culture is facing. In fact, it's a challenge that you might be facing, you might be feeling, that even though you're surrounded by people, you can still feel alone. Even though you can sit and flick through your social media and see what all of your friends are doing, by the way, you know that most of what gets posted is just the good stuff, not the bad stuff, right? And and it releases some dopamine in your brain that makes you feel high or good for a little moment, and then you come back to reality and realize, man, that's not really friendship. How do we develop meaningful relationships and deep friendships? In 2016 and 2017, the U.S., uh, um, the U.S. In, uh, faced, um, the, sorry, the U.S. for the first time since the 1960s uh, saw a decline in life, life, inspe- life expectancy. So in 2016, 2017, they saw for the first time since the 1960s a decline in life in- expectancy in the American population. Now, in the 1960s, they were able to pinpoint what the problem was, and the problem was that there was a flu epidemic that took place in the 60s that that really did kind of affect the life expectancy or the average life expectancy of the American population. But in 2016, 2017, they couldn't understand why is it that life expectancy has been dropping? 
Like, we have all of these advances in, medical, in the medical field, and, and we have all of these vaccines that take care of all of these kinds of flu epidemics and these kinds of things. What is it that's causing this reduction in, or this decrease in life expectancy here in the U.S.? What they saw play out, and they called it deaths of despair because they saw a, a rise in suicides. They saw a rise in alcoholism. They saw a rise in, in uh, drug overdoses. And as sociologists began to dig in and try to understand why are we seeing this drop in life expectancy just five, six years ago here in America, why is it that we're seeing it? The conclusion that they came to was that loneliness... Was the, that, there was, that it was the result of loneliness. What they discovered was that in America, there was a rising tide of loneliness that was actually leading to a drop in life expectancy. In fact, one researcher says that chronic loneliness is more dangerous than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Relationships impact your health. Relationships impact your well-being. In fact, in May, the Surgeon General of the United States of America issued a warning noting that we had functionally passed uh, uh, through the COVID pandemic, but that there was another epidemic that was spreading, and the epidemic was of loneliness. Prior to 19, or 2020, so this is prior to you know, six feet of distance, isolating, st- you know, staying in place. Like, mem- Remember that? Anybody remember that? You know, like a painful memory, right? Prior to any of that happening, what the, what the scientists had discovered is that one in two Americans were battling feelings of isolation and loneliness. In fact, the study that the Surgeon General had, um, had uh, commissioned and the research that had been done, uh, some of the folks, uh, just quotes from, from the studies were, were along the lines of this. One person said that I feel like I'm shouldering life's burdens on my own. Another person said that if I disappeared tomorrow, no one would notice. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel like, man, I'm surrounded by all of these people. I, I'm in connected to all of these people in social media. But sometimes I feel like I'm shouldering life's burdens on my own. I'm not sure if I was to disappear tomorrow if anybody would even notice. We have a nation in crisis. There's an epidemic of loneliness that's taking place. In fact, over the past 50 years, there has been a 20% increase in the time people spend alone. In fact, when you look at the generation of millennials and Gen Z, 20-somethings, among them, there's been a 70% decrease in the amount of time they spend with friends over the last 20 years. We're becoming more isolated. We're becoming, uh, as a nation, more lonely. And this sense that, man, I'm carrying the burdens of life on my own is becoming more and more prevalent in the world in which we live. Now, coincidentally, 20 years ago was about the time that social media showed up. Now, I'm not blaming social media, but I think we ought to have an honest conversation about it sometimes. That, you know, that social media tricks us into believing that, man, I'm so connected and I know everything that's going on. And like I said earlier, there's this hit of dopamine that kind of caused me to feel like, yeah, I'm connected. I know what's going on. But very quickly that dissipates and you discover that, man, I'm alone. And the reality is that God did not wire you to be alone. In fact, what the Surgeon General of of America is trying to tell us is that we are wired for social connection and it's actually vital to our well-being. You and I being connected to other people is vital to our well-being. Now, I love when science catches up with what God actually said in the first place. Don't you love that? Like, I love that, you know, in, in that case, yes, let's believe the science. I probably am going to get in trouble for saying that statement. But, but my point is simply this, is that, that science, the Surgeon General of America, is actually saying to us that we're wired for social connection, and it's vital to our well-being. And the Surgeon General is simply echoing what Scripture teaches us. You and I are wired for meaningful connection to God and to one another. And the Surgeon General is just echoing what the Bible has to say. 
And so well, here's what I want to do today. Next week, we're going, to go, uh, we're going to go a little bit more practical and do some things like that. You know, we're going to kind of, you know, key questions to ask of the person sitting next to you in the bathroom stall so that you can maybe become friends. Like, we'll do that kind of stuff next week. But today, what I want to do is I simply want to help us understand what is it that God said about relationships? How is it that you and I, being wired by him for meaningful connection with him, but as we're going to discover today, we're actually wired for meaningful connection to one another. And what's it going to take for us to thrive and have the very best experience in that? And so here's what we discover, and I'm going to draw a little bit today, and uh, they, were, they laughed at me in first service. I know that you will be much more supportive of my artwork <laughs> as I draw, you know. I ain't no Bob Ross. No, Bob, is it Bob Ross? It is Bob Ross, okay. Yeah, sometimes I say things and then I question myself. But, <clears throat> but here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, so we haven't gotten very far, In God's story. Like we're like at the, you know, once upon a time. Or as the Bible says, in the beginning. So at the very start of things, as God is putting all of this stuff together. As he's putting the planet together. As he's populating it with trees and mountains and water. And then he puts the animals and he puts the sun, moon and the stars. It says in the beginning, as God's doing all of this stuff, it says this. It says, God created. God created. In the beginning, God created. Now, if you read on, what you'll discover is that the the Bible tells us it this way. It says that the earth was formless and void. In meaning that whatever existed, whatever was here, whatever was going on on the planet, and I'm not smart enough to know what it was, I'm just going to read what the text says. And what the text says is that whatever existed here on planet Earth was formless and void. Meaning, if I could use another word to kind of describe what was actually happening, I have to be able to spell. I think I spelt it right. What was going on on the planet was chaos. That it was formless, it was void, there was no structure to it, that God was, the, 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 the planet on which God was beginning to form and create something was, was without form, where there was no structure to it, there was just chaos that was going on. And, and what God does is God says, he speaks, and, he, and you know this if you know your Bible, he says, let there be, and he says, let there be light, Right? And then he separates the light from the darkness. And he puts the sun in the day and the moon and the stars at night, right? And then he creates the waters and then he creates the planet, the land. And then he creates, uh, you know, the the vegetation. And, And what God is doing is God is bringing order out of chaos. So here we have God. This is, we're just, this is rudimentary. We're going right back to the beginning. What are we understanding about what God was doing in the very outset? Well, God is creating order out of chaos. God is speaking and saying, let there be light. Where there was something that was formless and void and it didn't make sense and there was no structure, God is beginning to bring structure and order to what is taking place. And and so what we realize is if you carry on down then into Genesis chapter 1, going down into verse 26, that's when God begins to speak about you and I. And this is what he says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Now, isn't that interesting? Then God, which sounds singular, doesn't it? Said, Let us make mankind or humankind in our image image. Now, if you've been around church, uh, and the Bible would teach us this, we believe in the Trinity. And the Trinity, I'm going to, no, this is where it now gets difficult, so I need you to cheer me on here, okay? I'm going to try to, I was just in Ireland, so I'm going to try and do this kind of Celtic thing, that kind of this picture of, uh, at least, I don't know if it's Celtic or not, but we're going to claim it as Celtic. Okay. All right, let's see. Oh. You guys are so good. So that's either Star Trek 
or it's a symbol for the Trinity. And God, who is one in essence, is three in person, right? There's like these, there's this expression of the Godhead or the Trinity that's made up, and, and we learn this from the Bible, and you see this throughout the Old and New Testament, and you see God, look, if you notice in Colossians, it says that all things, talking about creation, were created in, through, and for Jesus. So there's Jesus, the Son of God, and it's God who's ordering all of this. And if you notice in Genesis chapter one, it says that the Spirit of God was brooding over. And so you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit who are in perfect, not just unity of purpose, but community of relationship. God exists in community. God exists in perfect community. And so he says, let us, God, who is in perfect community, he says, let us create mankind in our image. Now, there's a word that kind of, and I think it's Latin. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. But you may have heard this, imago Dei. And imago Dei is literally a, a way of saying, in the image of God. So let us God, who is in perfect community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, says, let us create mankind, you and I, in our image. And, and what that literally means is that we are to image, or we are to reflect, so this is supposed to be a mirror with a frame around it. What do you think? Is it good? <laughs> Guys, honestly, I think I'm switching careers at this point. God says, let us, who exists in perfect community, create humankind in our image. Meaning that we are to image or we are to reflect who God is. Who is God? He exists in perfect community. He exists in perfect relationship. And what God is saying in creation and in creating you and I is I who exist in perfect communion, in perfect community, in perfect relationship, I want you to also exist experiencing this kind of community. And what we're going to discover is it's not just this kind of community with God, it's this kind of community with one another. Now here, here is, now we, we come to our first problem in the Bible. And what's so interesting is that the first problem, I'm going to sound like a heretic right now. You might kick me out of the church, but give me a moment to prove it. The first problem that shows up in the Bible is not sin. What we're going to discover is that the first problem that shows up in the Bible is loneliness. And remember, God who exists in perfect community creates us to image or reflect or experience him and how he has created us, Right? Which means that we're designed actually to create relation, or experience relationship. And this is where it shows up. It says this in Genesis, flipping over to chapter 2. The first problem shows up in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says that then God said, so he's created Adam, right? He's created Adam. And he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And so here we have something that is not good. Now, this is mind-boggling, isn't it? Because Adam is created, placed in the perfect environment. There's no sin. He's in this relationship with God. Like, surely everything is absolutely perfect the way it's meant to be. And God speaks into this situation and says, it's actually not good. There's something that's chaotic. There's something that's not ordered right. There's something that's not as it's meant to be. And God begins to help, he, God begins to communicate that there's something that needs to be ordered. There's something that needs to happen so that we can be who we are supposed to be. And so what we recognize is that, that God, he's saying there, that it's not good for man to be alone. Now, we have to, what we need to understand is sometimes we read this verse and we go, yes, it's not good for man to be alone. And I think the statistics, uh, this might be, I might be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. You know, a widower, right? So a man 
if his wife passes, oftentimes the man gets remarried, right? More often than not, right? And so sometimes what we do is we translate that and go, yeah, it's not good for the man, the male, to be alone. Don't leave a man to his own devices. He's just going to create trouble. (laughs) Right, women? It's true, isn't it? And so it is not good. I cannot leave my husband alone, right? Like that guy, he needs me real bad, right? And that is true, by the way. Isn't that right, guys? Right? But... What we need to understand about this verse is that the word that's used there in the Hebrew isn't the word ish, which is man. It's the word adam, which is humankind. And so what God is actually saying in this verse is it's not good for humankind to be alone. It's not good for you and I to be alone. God, who is in perfect community, in perfect relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? God, that's his existence. And he created us to image him, to reflect him. And in creating Adam or Adam, he's recognizing something's not good. Something's missing. And it's not just for Adam, man. It's for humankind. It's not good that humankind is alone. And what God is indicating here is God is saying that that you and I, we weren't designed to be alone. We actually need friends, which means that in those moments when you're feeling lonely, it's actually a sign of something that God created you for. Loneliness is actually, I think, a gift that points us to how God actually designed us to live life and experience life to its fullest. And it's always in the context of relationship. In fact, I would go as far as to say this. You you can't experience God the way he made you until you experience him alongside others. And this is what Genesis is trying to teach us. God, who's in perfect relationship and perfect community, has created us in his image. And part of that is that we are not alone, but that we are in community, that we are connected. In fact, loneliness, I said this way, loneliness points to our God-given need for relationships. And so what you have is God at the end of every day as he creates order, what does he say? It is good. When he creates the light, when he creates the night and day, when he creates the sun, moon, and stars, when he, creates, uh, or when he creates the animals and the plants, it is good, it is good, it is good, but something isn't good. And what we discover that isn't good is isolation. What isn't good is loneliness. And we see it as the first problem that appears in the Bible. It's the first problem that shows up. It's not good that you and I be alone. And here we are, 2023, in North America, in America, facing an epidemic of loneliness that's counterintuitive. It's not how God designed things to be. God actually designed us to be not in isolation, but to be in community. God designed us to be in community. And this is what it says. In fact, look, look, at God's, look what God's solution to the problem is. So he says, God says, it's not good that man be alone. And he goes on and he says this, I will make a, helper, a, helpful, a helper suitable for him. I like how the King James says it. King James says it this way. God fashioned a helpmeet. Now, doesn't that sound archaic? <laughs> you know, God's a fashion designer right? I'm a little biased because my son's a fashion designer in LA, but, but God fashioned, and, and because my son is kind of involved in that industry, like I know the amount of work that goes in to create something that we see at Target or Gap or wherever else we purchase our, our clothes from. And what God's saying, I'm fashioning, I'm putting together a help me. Now that's a really awkward phrase. What does that mean, Gareth? Like, you know, is that like traditionally, if you've been around church world, sometimes you may have been led to believe that, you know, the wife is the helpmeet. You know, anybody heard that? You know? And and unfortunately, because of that language, it kind of gets a little mixed, and that kind of feels a little chauvinistic, and how does that work? But actually, the word helpmeet right there just means equal. God creates an equal, right, who 
is there shoulder to shoulder, together to shoulder the burdens of life. Now, we most clearly see that in marriage. And because of the context of this, uh, this, this, uh, these verses, we oftentimes apply it to marriage. But remember what I said. God didn't use the word ish, Hebrew for male. He used the word adam for humanity. Meaning it's not good for humanity to be alone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create others that are equal that will shoulder the burden together. Meaning you see it most explicitly in marriage, but it's not limited to marriage. That God, who is in relationship, perfect relationship and community, created you and I to image him. And in imaging him, he actually designed us to live in community. God's created others to do life with. God has placed you on this planet, not in isolation, but alongside others, and that you and I were actually designed for relationship. You and I actually need relationships. It's not a problem to go, man, I feel lonely and I need some friends. That's an inbuilt thing that God placed inside of you. And the healthiest version of you psychologically, mentally, emotionally, physically, is found in when you have healthy relationships with other people. Now, what's interesting is that, that God, remember, God creates order out of chaos. And one of the things that you see, uh, you know, in this story is that there's chaos going on, right? And God creates, out of the darkness, it says that God creates and I'm going to try to do this. Don't laugh at me. Okay, I'm going to go up, and I'm going to go around. I'm going to come down. I'm going to do, do... Does anybody know what that is? It's not very good, but it's supposed to be a light bulb. <laughs> Some of you were guessing a light bulb, weren't you? Man, you are good, or I am good, that I drew a light bulb, that you understood. Here's the point that I'm trying to make, is that God, just like he creates light out of darkness, just like he creates order out of chaos, what's happening in our world and what's happening in the lives of so many human beings on this planet and in this country, even in this church, is that there's this chaos because we're prone to chaos because of sin. But what God does, he brings the light of relationship that brings order to life. And this is what the Surgeon General is trying to help. He's just echoing what the Bible teaches us, that we need relationships. And the healthiest version of you is found when you have healthy relationships. And so the question that I want to leave with us this morning is, well, then what is a, what is a friend? What does that look like? Because, Gareth, that's great. Like, we get that that's how God actually designed it to be. But what does it mean for us to have friends and be friends? And I thought this was a great definition of friendship uh, that I was reading this week. A friend is someone who knows you and loves you anyway. And isn't that true? That, man, there's a lot of people that can kind of know about me, but there's maybe only a few people that really know me and they love me anyway. And I think that's what God has built us and designed us for. In fact, the, new, the language of the New Testament shifts, um, not just, it's talking about meaningful relationships, that's what we're talking about here in Genesis, and we're talking about friendships, right? You know, the Bible says, in fact, Jesus said this in John 15, 15. He says, I no longer consider you servants, but I consider you friends. Like, that's how Jesus looks at us. And, and, and that definition of friendship... Man, that, could, that most aptly is applied to our relationship with Jesus, isn't it? Like, like Jesus knows us. He knows all our failings and our sins and our faults and our fa failings. But he loves us anyway. Right? And so Jesus says, you're my friend. But, but what's interesting about the New Testament is that the language that the New Testament starts to use is this language of family or familial. It's like you and I being connected like family. In fact, in, John, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, it says this, God sets the members or he sets people like you and I into his family, the church. And so what God in setting us in the church is doing is he's saying, hey, this is who I am. 
perfect relationship, perfect community. I've created you in my image so that you would image, reflect, and experience me that way. But the way that you best experience me is then through the relationships that you have with other people, other folks that are following Jesus. In fact, the New Testament, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but it's in the Bible, so you can take it up with the Bible. It says this in Matthew chapter 12, <coughs> 14, because the, the language of the New Testament and what Jesus seems to be indicating is that your spiritual family is actually the family that takes primary. It's like primary. Like this is where you become who God designed you to be and who he ordered your life to be is in the context of a spiritual family. In fact, if you go over to Matthew chapter 12, in verse 20, uh, 47, um, someone you know, tells Jesus, hey, your mom and your brothers are outside and they want to talk to you. You know, husbands, have you ever had that? You know, um, hey, we need to talk. You know, husbands and wives, you know, hey, we need to talk. Oh, oh I feel like I'm in big trouble, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and so here's Jesus' mother and brother standing outside. You know, I don't know, arms crossed, feet tapping. You better get your butt out here, Jesus. We need to talk. And we need to talk soon, right? And Jesus' response is so interesting. In verse 48, he says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, now, the point isn't that Jesus isn't saying reject your family. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is trying to communicate to you and I, those of us who are followers of Jesus, those of us who have been placed into the body of Christ, what Jesus is trying to communicate to us and saying is that these new relationships that you have with other brothers and sisters in Christ is like that of a family. It's characterized by deep friendship that spends time together, that's le that leans upon one another. It's why Jesus said that, that my commandment is this, that you love one another as I have loved you, and greater love has no man than to lay down his life for the life of another. Now, the challenge is that we live in a world of convenience, don't we? My daughter experienced this this summer. Uh, you know, she had lived in D.C., and she had roommates, and all was awesome, and they were like, they had a great friendship. She moves back here, and, uh, you know, she's trying to kind of maintain the friendship, and it's like they just kind of moved on. And that was a friendship of convenience. And there's nothing wrong with friendships of convenience. In fact, so many of the relationships that you and I have in the world in which we live, they're practical, they're transactional, they're functional. You know, my kids play on the same soccer team. The kids go to the same school. We live in the neighborhood together. And there's nothing wrong with those relationships. I'm grateful for relationships that are practical and functional and transactional and, and they're convenient. Like, that is awesome. But the point that I'm trying to make this morning is that you and I are actually wired or made for more than just practical or transactional relationships. Those things are efficient. But my question to you this morning is, are they sufficient? Because God created you for something more. God created you for kind of relationships that are deeper. And so the question that I really want to leave us with this morning is, if God created me for deeper, more meaningful relationships, what step do I need to take today? My purpose this morning is simply to get us to a point where we would understand that we are actually not just wired for relationships on a superficial level. God actually wired you for a deeper level of relationship, the kind of relationship that's meaningful, the kind of relationship that, man, when you're going through something or someone else is going through something, you're there for them. Now, the challenge with those kinds of relationships is that they don't happen overnight, you and I, we have to be diligent, we have to be intentional, and we have to understand that those kinds of relationships are going to take time and effort. But what I want to challenge us, and I'm going to use the words of the Surgeon General, Vivek Murphy, and he said this, if we fail to build a more connected society and live more connected lives, we will pay an ever-increasing price in the form of our individual and collective health and well-being, and we will continue to splinter and divide until we can no longer stand as a community or a country. Instead of coming together to take on great challenges before us, we will further retreat into our corners, angry, sick, and alone. I don't think that's what God has in mind when he said, let us create humankind in our image. And then he goes on, he says, hold on, this sum's not right. It's not good that they're alone. They're actually designed for meaningful relationship. And so my challenge to us this fall, my challenge to us today 
And next week we'll be a little bit more practical and the following week we're gonna talk a little bit about covenant type relationships and what does that look like? But my challenge to us today is that I think the Lord is calling us to take a step. Now for some of us in the room and maybe many of us in the room, we're getting to this place where it's like, man, I need that. I need those kind of relationships. And, And the step for you is, man, take a step. Move towards something or someone and we'll talk about that in a second. But the other side of that is, could I challenge us this morning that maybe, just maybe, the Lord is actually asking you not to be in receive mode, but to be in give mode. That maybe you're the one that's actually supposed to create the environment, the space, the place, the group, whatever it might be, where others can come and begin to connect and begin to develop a relationship that over the coming months and years and decades develop into the kind of thing that God actually designed you for. You're not designed to go alone. You're not designed to live in isolation. You're not designed to live at a superficial level, just kind of connecting transactionally with other people. You and I are actually designed to connect at a meaningful level with other people. And honestly, the way I think that we best and most fully experience God is through relationships with other people. And so there's a really simple step you can take. Super simple. For some of you, I'm gonna take this big gathering, I'm gonna take what I experience in the lobby and the conversation that I have, which is rich and wonderful and beautiful, but I'm gonna take a step of actually gonna get connected to relationship. I'm gonna find a group that I'm gonna be a part of this fall. Some of you, it's your turn, it's your time to say, I'm going to create this experience for other people. I'm gonna open up my home. I'm gonna set time aside at a coffee shop. If you need a place or space to meet, even if it's here at the building, like let's figure out a way for us. You're supposed to create the place for people to engage in meaningful relationship the way God designed them to be.